Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 138, we're going to talk power tubes, power tube matching, how they're tested, what to do if you lose a tube in your quad, and you know how to save a quad. Okay, but first, caution everyone. Electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. <laughs> Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. I mean, we're laughing, but that caution is really, really important. Pay, pay attention to it. Respect electricity. It can be very dangerous. Okay. Now, in the simplest configuration you can have, unless you're running mono. If you're running mono, you need one power tube, but that's going to be pretty rare these days. Yep. So in the simplest configuration you could have, you're going to have a single power tube in the left channel and a single tube in the right channel. Now these are the lovely sounding uh, GU50 power tubes um, that we use in our, in our monoblock kits and they have a unique sound and they have a typical label that we would put on a power tube let me grab a pointer here and here i've marked 74 milliamps that's the idle current now charles is going to talk more about the technical side in a minute and this one has 74 milliamps we are, if we have a date code we put the date code and of course the inventory number but that's not what we're talking about today so if we have a lot of inventory, a power tube is fairly common. We're looking for 5% or better is, a, I would consider a perfect match. But if a vintage power tube um, is rare or hard to find, 10% um, or better is, that's... Yeah, it's acceptable. That's perfect. It's perfectly fine. Now, so that's that's your simplest amp. One power tube in each channel. You'd like to see a fairly close match on the idle emissions. What about a more common configuration? Well, that would be a quad of power tubes. So let's just get them all lined up here and looking pretty. <laughs> now, this is one of our favorite EL34s. This is the RFT made in the former East Germany. Hu they were made in huge numbers. And they were such a nice EL34 that even big companies like Siemens basically used the um, the RFT as their EL34. So mm -hmm. this tube's been rebranded by almost everybody. Very similar to what happened with the Mullard Phillips EL34. They made it for RCA. They made it for everybody basically well made too made in large quantities so you see them all over the place this just so happens to be one of the factory original labels that's on it it's actually pretty unusual to even see them um so this is your most con common configuration the um the well-loved budget uh amplifier the r8 uses this configuration so you got four power tubes you've got two in the left channel two in the right they're in push-pull sequence. So let's just deal with one channel. So this is a class AB amp. So when one tube is amplifying the positive phase, the other tube's amplifying the negative phase. And of course, the other channel is doing the same thing. So we've done videos on what class AB and class A and the differences. So we're not going to get into that. But look at the matching here. Now, this is pretty close, 37 milliamps, and that's a really good testing number as well for an EL34, 40 milliamps. Now, you could do it this way, but I would much prefer to see the 37 milliamps match together. And you'll notice that uh, when we ship most power tubes as sets, we'll mark the sequence of how we think you should set it up. V1, V2, V3, V4, just like that. So, now, what about how we get to these testing numbers? And, oh, and I wanted to mention, just because we've talked about two tubes and four tubes, that doesn't mean that everything we're talking about for 
it's it's this is a very common setup but some people will have four tubes aside so this would be a whole channel that or you'll would, even see 16 tubes eight tubes per side eight tubes per side and there's all different configurations of how they'd be running but basically they're either running in push pull or they're running let's just say that this was a a quad in the left channel for example so how would that work so you would have two tubes in parallel, mm -hmm. two tubes in parallel. Now, when this is amplifying the positive wave as a pair of tubes, basically working as a single tube, that's what a parallel pair of tubes would be. This would be doing the negative way. Now you could build a much bigger amp by doing this and you would have four tubes in parallel, right? So anyways, that's not what we're here really to talk about. I just thought it'd be fun. So, Charles, you've got some technical stuff to share with us. What I have do. You, what have you got? Okay, so... Let, let me get out of your road here first. This might not be as exciting as looking at tubes on the screen, but here we've got a representative load line of the EL34 and where we like to test it at on our power tube tester. So, for all of you unfamiliar with the load line, what it is is it's showing the operating range of a tube in a certain situation. So that's this red line that's right here. And as the signal's going up and down, it's going to be moving along this load line. Not nearly as big as what you're depicting. No, and generally you want it to be operating within an area of it that's fairly linear. And linearity is the consistency and the spacing of these blue lines. So show them a really non-linear area. Well, if you take a look down at the very bottom here and maybe further over to the side, you see how the spacing is getting smaller and the lines are getting curved more. That is a non-linear area. This would be considered a linear area. This would be considered a non-linear area. What about the rest of the testing data or the the, the layout of the, the sheet here? Because there's a lot of numbers on here. It can be a little confusing. Let's break so, it down. So the bottom line is easy. Yeah, this is our plate voltage or B plus voltage. So we have it coming all the way up from zero to 650. Volts DC. Mm -hmm. On this side here, we have the current. So we go from all the ways from zero up to 500, although we're obviously not anywhere up in this range here for this tube. And that would be 500 milliamps, right? Yep, 500 milliamps. Which would be half an ampere or an amp for short. Exactly. And now all these blue lines are the grid voltage. And whenever you're dealing with grid voltage, most tubes are going to be operating in a negative grid voltage. So the first line or somewhere close to the first is going to be zero volts on the grid. And from there, you're going to be going further into the negative. So you can see we've got negative eight volts on this line, negative 16 volts here, minus 24 here, and so on and so forth as we go down. And what this is doing is it's choosing the point that the tube is operating at. Or, so, or it's setting the emission point, right? Exactly, and it's whenever we're testing it and we're setting this statically, we're simulating a point that would be there naturally during a sine wave as it's going up and down. Now, th these load lines aren't created mathematically. They're actually plotted from mm -hmm. a lab bench. Well, it is mathematically, but traditionally they were plotted on a lab bench and they'd That's be right. drawing it out with a ruler. You can actually create these load lines electronically too. There are um, load line generators that you can plug tubes into that will draw these out like on old oscilloscopes. Really quite interesting. But the vast majority of what we're working with for our vintage uh, data sheets I'm pretty sure it would have been plotted out. Oh, absolutely. On a piece. Somebody would have had a, a lab bench test equipment and they would have actually plotted the operating point. So what's this red dotted line that's so weird? Okay, so the red dotted line is the maximum dissipation, the maximum plate dissipation of the tube. That's allowed. And you can see how it sort of drops in and disappears down here. So that means that you can run the tube, say at this point right here, and that's okay. If you push above that, you're running it in an area where it wasn't designed, you're pushing it too hard. And that's whenever you get things like red plating on a tube. Now the dotted line is the maximum rating. Exactly. And power tubes normally are run at what, about 60? Around 60%. Yeah, 70% yeah. 
is legit too, I think, and but not much more than that. It depends too on the topology. I mean, in class AB, you have two tubes doing half the work. In class A, you have one tube doing all the work. So it depends on how you're pushing it. So this red dot right here is what we would call the idle emissions point. This is where the tube would be sitting at uh, zero volts on the grid after it's been biased. Now, just because it's zero volts on the grid after it's been biased doesn't mean that it's really zero volts. It's actually closer to negative 36 volts. And at negative 36 volts, whenever we have no signal applied, we would expect to see around 34, oh, I can't get that on screen. There it is, 34 milliamps of current. So that's what we would expect from an EL34 that's operating around Newell stock levels to be at. And the, that number will vary a lot between manufacturers, even yeah. tubes that were made a couple of years apart will have this. In fact, among power tubes, a lot of power tubes, I was going to say the EL34 has a large variance on, on idle emissions, but every, almost well, all of them do. So many different manufacturers and techniques, they were all aiming to get within the same spec range, which they do, but there's going to be variants. So you might see a tube that's new old stock and it tests consistently around 34 milliamps. You might see one that tests closer to 40. For example, I mean, we were and looking at those RFTs earlier and they were a bit higher than 34. Or you might see a lot come in at around 28 milliamps. It exactly. doesn't make the, it a bad tube. It just means that's, that's how the tube is manufactured. Mm -hmm. So you're actually going to show us how we get that number on our right on our tester. Right? So we have a custom power tube tester, and what we do with it is we supply a voltage, we put a negative voltage on the grid, and there's a few other variables we have to keep track of. But what we're looking for is to see how much current we get whenever we set the B plus, the plate voltage, and the grid voltage to these numbers, and then we record. The current and that'll tell us how well the tube is operating at that point and that becomes this number that we record can you see it on screen here there we go yeah. and that'll become the recorded milliamp or idle emission number okay all right so now it takes a little bit for us to get the tube tester set up so we're going to do a little bit of uh, magic of television here well that was easy okay well here's our power tube tester Many of you have seen this before on the channel, uh, and we have it currently set up so that you can see the cathode current in milliamps on the screen, on this multimeter here, and our negative grid bias voltage over here, which right now we have hovering around negative 36 volts. So if we test the tube here, and while well, our B plus is also 400 volts, so you can't really get that on screen. We ran out of room for meters. <laughs> and the filament voltage has another meter on it, and it's at 6.32 volts. Yeah, because that actually does make a significant difference. So we monitor everything here. So if we run a test here on one of the RFTs we were looking at earlier, and we make sure we bring this grid down. Let's try and get the... Tester is very, very sensitive, but we're right around 40 milliamps, which is where what, this tube was testing before. Yeah. And with this tester, because it's such a stable tester, uh, we get repeatable uh, measurements even, you know, years after we've tested a tube. So as the tube hasn't been running in circuit, of course. And that's so important for testing, matching and replacing tubes. So, so what happens if we adjust this grid bias a little bit? Well, Whenever you're shifting the grid and you're keeping the B plus the same, it's going to affect how much current there is. So let's adjust this a little bit here. If we lower this negative grid bias voltage, you can very quickly see that our current jumps up. Now we've only shifted by about three quarters of a volt here and you can see that we've already gone up almost four milliamps almost four milliamps now if we go the other direction what we're doing is we're heading towards cutoff here and cutoff is the point where there's no current being passed so let's go all the way up to about 37 minus 37 and you can see here we've dropped dramatically down to about 35.5 milliamps so it shows you just how important it is to have a stable 
uh, grid bias voltage because it affects your testing numbers dramatically. Now what we're doing is mimicking a tube in circuit in an app. Exactly. Unfortunately, hmm, 90 plus percent, maybe 99 percent of commercial testers, particularly older ones, do not test power tubes properly. They're not testing them at the correct B plus voltages. They're often testing them much lower and they're not testing them for um, the operating current the same way that we are. Yeah, most, I mean, the better of the vintage testers will test around 220 volts on mm -hmm. the plate, which is just not enough voltage. Right. There are very few amps today that would run an EO34 at 220 volts. Typically, they'd run them around 400 volts. And you can see that the variance here, so if you're operating around 220 volts, you have all this space here for testing. The maximum current's much higher, and your results are just going to be very different compared to how it would be tested at the uh, at a more reasonable operating point. Well, thanks for setting that up, Charles. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, let's uh, get this put away. Movie magic. Well, that was magic, Charles. So we've got, you've got, let's say a very typical setup. You've got a quad of EL34s. It could be a quad of KT88s. It could be a quad of 6550s, whatever you've got in your amp. Um, and you've had a tube die on you. You've had it red plate in front of you. You shut down right away. Hopefully. <laughs> you, sh you Well, one of our rules is we do not operate our tube equipment uh, without somebody in the room. Yep. Never, ever turn your tube gear on and wander around the house and leave it alone. That's it's just not a wise thing to do. You can do that with good quality solid state, but tubes, mm, no, I wouldn't do it. I just would not do it. Um, so you've lost a tube. Doesn't matter which tube, but let's say you lost this one. Your quad is no longer working properly, and um, and you're wondering what the heck to do. Now, if you bought from a reputable tube seller, there's a very, very good chance that they have a record of the sale and that they've recorded the uh, testing numbers of the tubes they sold you in that match quad, and with any luck, they'll have a replacement tube. That's how we operate, and that's how we've operated since the business opened. We have records going back years now for every single tube. It doesn't matter if it's a power tube. We record everything. Ev everything. If we sell you a pair of 12AX7s, we have the record, the GM number. Now, we're not talking about mutual conductance here. We're Here we're talking about idle emissions, which is how you test a power tube properly. So don't... Um, don't abandon three tubes. Certainly don't throw them out unless they're, you know, complete Chinese garbage. <laughs> um, and I have thrown Chinese tubes in the garbage. Uh, they're just such frustrating tubes. Um, and it's a reason, one of the reasons why we just don't carry, we, we I refuse to carry poor quality tubes, period. I just, we well, don't. There's nothing wrong with Chinese production. If they made good tubes, we'd be stocking them. Yeah. 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 And there are some premium tube manufacturers out of China, but it's just, I just find vintage power tubes are so much more reliable. They sound so much better. And, you know, that's what we're into. So, so never abandon. If you have a good quality set of vintage power tubes that's not a match set, do something with them. Either find the fourth tube by contacting the seller and seeing if you can get a match to your data, which you can do in our case. Or just simply stick them up on Facebook Marketplace or wherever and get them moved to somebody who will collect a whole, like we do. We have, mm -hmm. at any point in time, we might have 100 EL34 RFTs. We might have 100 Mullard XF2s. Um, and for harder to find tubes like the our favorite Svetlana's, uh, the KT88s and the 6550s and even the EL34s, they're becoming rare tubes, mm -hmm. all of those tubes. And so we might only have a dozen in stock, but we will bring in th three tubes. And yep. though we'll often see three tubes for sale. Yeah. And that of course is the reason why a quad has been, has burnt out and we'll put them on our tester. It doesn't matter if a power tube arrives with testing numbers. We do not care. <laughs> we take off the, we don't trust anybody. And you know, uh, it's 
almost embarrassing when I see the numbers on some tubes and then we put them on our calibrated testers and see what and what fact, it's actually coming what in. is actually <laughs> coming in at so absolutely keep power vintage power tubes I mean the whole point of this discussion is vintage power tubes are becoming harder and harder to find they're mm -hmm. getting rare and ex eventually they will be extinct and the reason for that of course is power tubes work hard and they run hard and they don't have anywhere near the lifespan of um, of a voltage gain amplifier like a 6SN7 or a 12AX7. Hmm. So we've got to keep all these, particularly these orphan tubes, moving and in circulation so that quads can be made up, pairs can be made up, and you know, hmm. so on. And of course, if you are buying a quad of good vintage tubes, check and see if there's a spare available from whoever you're buying them from. That's Sometimes we'll have them. Sometimes we won't. That's right. I mean, in our sets, we actually encourage people to buy a spare to spare match power tube at the point of purchase of the set, mm -hmm. because it's easy for us at that point to look in the inventory and see if we can find one. And that will give you a lot of longevity before you even lo lose the quad down to three. You'll have you'll have a spare you can drop in and keep it going. And with any luck, you could get years and years before you've got to start looking for a spare. Yeah, and you know, five years down the line, if a tube fails, it might be way harder to find a match for it or, you know, find a match for a reasonable price. Yeah, and that's been sort of my motto for about two years now. I've been saying, get as many spares of the tubes you love in stock before you can't, yeah. Yeah, before you can't find them anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, Charles, what came in? All right, well, not a whole lot, but we did get something really interesting here. Well, we got a lot of these. <laughs> yeah. So, we've talked a lot lately about RFTs. Let me uh, zoom in here. This is a little guy compared to those EL34s. Well, actually, I guess I can't zoom in. We're all, all the way in already. Okay, let me bring it to you. And get the focus right. There we go. All right. So what we have here is an RFT ECC83, which is of course their version of a 12AX7. And we just got in a whole bunch of these from a great seller in Eastern Europe. And finding new old stock 12AX7s these days, it's with, almost- With close matching numbers. With close matching numbers, you know, ones that haven't been selected out for being uh, like mismatched sections and all that. It's as difficult as finding good vintage power tubes. It's really challenging, and it's one of our most high-demand tubes. Yeah, we sell... If we have a good 12AX7 in stock uh, in match pairs, we sell out really quickly. And this was great because we got enough in, we'll have 12AX7s in stock for a little while. And the RFT is an amazing sounding 12AX7. It sounds so so good. We're going to have to actually put up a, a recording maybe next week at some point. I don't know. We'll, we'll see when we can get it up. Uh, but I spent a good chunk of yesterday listening to these tubes and they just sound fantastic. Well, you made a recording. We can put it in the store oh, under the tube listing. Yeah, can't actually, we? yeah. So go there and uh, by the time this video is up, it should be in the store and you can have a listen to it and see how it sounds. And I think we can put a link below the video camera. That'll make it even easier for okay, people, we'll, yeah. We'll put a link in for you. And uh, it's one of our favorite tracks. We won't tell you what it is because it has a really, <laughs> I love the beginning. It's, when I was a kid, it was one of my favorite, favorite pieces of music from one of my favorite rock bands. Uh, it's very dynamic. And uh, we get a little bit more of RFT tube history to here because we have a different factory logo on this tube. And this one is another tube shaped logo, but with a stylized N. And that means that it was produced in the Newhouse factory. I'll, I'm just going to leave it at that. It has a much longer name. Well, they pay homage to one of their uh, uh, the East German uh, writers. Yeah. And I forgot her name. Anna, I think, is her name. And they, uh, they produced a lot of these small signal tubes. So uh, they're in the store now. They sound great. We have of a whole bunch of matched pairs. So if you're interested in some 12AX7s, we would highly recommend these. And you've cleared them all for low noise. Flip the label over so people yeah. can see. So whenever a tube goes through one of our testing amps and we've cleared it for microphonics, mm -hmm. we've cleared it for quality sound, 
And we've cleared it for noise. And we cleared it for noise. We give it a little red tick. A little red check mark. So that we don't have to do it all over again. But when we pay, and we paid a lot of money for these tubes, but when we pay a lot of money for a particular order, we have to clear them early so that if we have an issue with them, we can bring it back to the wholesaler. Yeah, sometimes we're clearing stuff as we're selling it because we have a lot of stock and we know if there's a noisy tube, we, we can just swap in something else and test it. But with these guys, we went through all of them and right how, away. How many showed up defective, Charles? Every single one of them tested with absolutely no microphonics and no noise. Which is unusual with a high gain tube like this. Very unusual. They, they all sounded great and there wasn't a single issue with them so no in fairness our supplier is one of those our quality wholesalers and he's very particular and he knows that we're particular so mm -hmm. i think he probably weeded out the bad tubes in the lot well if he did he did a good job because these have been great and uh yeah uh, we hope you enjoy listening to them okay well thanks for that charles well if you stay to the very end we've got some discount codes to help you out and there's a hidden code here that's easy to figure out. Somebody got it this week, cost us big money, but that's great because, you know, times are tough and I love handing out discounts, especially to returning customers. If you're a new customer, we love you too. And we've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. We can reach about 99, well, maybe 98% of you for that rate. <laughs> but if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.